ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله عز وجل وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار <تصفيق> Uh, the, the subjects and the topics of this conference were chosen carefully just to deal with problems that we have avoided tackling for quite a while until these topics or these subjects have actually uh, started, I would say, affecting our communities here in Canada and other countries in the West uh, to a great extent, even something beyond our imagination. Uh, usually the problems that our youth specifically face uh, is what we can summarize in the common phrase faith crisis and this is something I deal with almost on a daily basis almost on a daily basis there are Muslims young Muslims who are questioning their faith or doubting their faith who have some kind of a defiant attitude and they're rebelling against the traditions that they were meant to be raised upon and there are reasons for that. There are reasons for that. As I said, we've been avoiding these topics because they're quite, uh, they, they, they're not easy to deal with. And oftentimes, a lot of the speakers don't have hands-on experience with them. And as I said, so we've been trying to avoid them. And in our denial, we were hoping that they would just disappear. But it seems that they actually got worse because there are institutions, there are individuals and there is a lot of financing that's going to push into such kind of influences. Specifically, we're talking about atheism, we're talking about people doubting their faith, and we're talking about issues of sexual orientation and how to handle these, how to handle these issues. Because we're living in a society that's quite open about these issues, where personal freedom is quite stressed, and we don't seem to be giving practical solutions. Oftentimes, what you get from an imam or a sheikh or a da'iyah is a very general answer that doesn't help someone who's going through a faith crisis, most likely. There are good exceptions, alhamdulillah, but they are, as I said, limited to certain individuals and they have not been addressed community-wide. So we are hoping the, this, in this conference at least to set the stage uh, and to pave the way for a wider scale approach and maybe uh, to develop an attitude where we can address such issues head on and we can call a spade a spade inshallah deal with these issues with some kind of balance and create some kind of perspective that will inshallah enable the Muslim community to handle these issues uh, in a better way than we used in the past. Uh, the issues, some of the issues won't be comfortable to talk about and uh, I would say a lot of the, uh, the advice a lot of the instructions, a lot of the perspectives will be addressing the parents because the parents are in a position of authority and power in the family. And we are talking about our younger generation. So kids need some kind of instruction and education and tarbiya and tazkiya. But generally speaking, conferences are not the ideal uh, kind of framework for that. So you will, the parents will, might feel uncomfortable as a lot of the advice will be directed at them. The second reason they might feel very uncomfortable is that maybe the way we've been doing parenting and education for our kids uh, will be challenged sometimes. Maybe it worked within certain context, within certain traditions, in certain countries, with certain backgrounds, yes, but a lot of these approaches are actually situational. They're time specific, they're place specific, culture specific, and they're not universal. So when we implement them in a society like uh, this society here in Canada and the West generally, they might actually bring about the results opposite to what we desire or opposite to what they have been producing in other cultures and in other settings. So this will be a, uh, a reason or a cause of discomfort, a great discomfort. And the reason is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed us as humans. 
You know, the Arabs have a very famous line of poetry where the poet says, وَعَيْنُ الرِّضَى عَنْ كُلِّ عَيْبٍ كَلِيلَةٌ وَلَكِنَّ عَيْنَ الْمَقْتِ تُبْدِي الْمَسَاوِيَا Basically what it says is that when you are happy with something, when you develop a liking to something, you overlook the mistakes. So when you develop a liking to a person, you won't be able to see their mistakes. It's a matter of perception. You just, you unconsciously will overlook their mistakes and their faults. And you only see the good things about them. And this is why you have the celebrity culture. When you, see, when you admire someone, you fail to see their mistakes. On the contrary, your perception sometimes will even deceive you where you see their mistakes and their faults as something that's praiseworthy. But when you are unhappy with someone or with something, you tend to see only the negatives about it. And even the good things about this thing or the good aspects of this thing, you will actually tend to see them in a negative eye. That's how we humans are. This is how we are designed. So when some of the views on parenting that we have been raised upon, probably they've been there for hundreds of years and they've been probably uh, to a certain extent they've been successful in certain uh, backgrounds, in certain cultures. But today they're actually producing, as I said, the opposite results. When these are challenged, this will be a cause of, or a reason for discomfort. So we might be a bit defensive. So what m I'm calling upon every parent, so if you hear something that you don't, or you disapprove of, or you don't feel comfortable with, or maybe you have something to challenge, you know, give it a time. Be patient. Don't try to respond on, on the moment. Don't try to dismiss it completely on the spot. You might need to entertain it for a while and check it and let your mind or let your brain work on it. See maybe, maybe it is something that has merit within it. Maybe it will be useful for you. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is generally what the conference will be about. And these are some of the precautions that I needed and uh, uh, some kind of just points I wanted to, uh, to draw your attention to. I will be talking about how to prepare our children for the future. Because today, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we admit it or not, a lot of our youth, when they go specifically to university, when they make the tr transition from high school to university, they are faced with a completely new environment where there is almost unlimited freedom and there is a lot of uh, exposure to people who challenge their faith. There's a lot of discourse and a lot of talk about how religion disagrees with science and that science debunks religion. There's a lot of talk and a lot of professors in universities are actually very actively speaking about these issues. And they are brainwashing our younger generation and the younger generation is faced with questions that come from experts, from professors. They are completely unprepared and they're completely challenged. So some of the, you'll find some of the students will completely, uh, you know, take for themselves and dissociate and they will probably, uh, you know, even when it comes to their attendance to the classes, they will actually uh, observe only the, the minimum acceptable. And they will try, most, some of them even speak during the classes. And the reason is, these people are trying to protect their faith. Some people who are attentive, and these are sometimes hard-working students, and they pay a lot of attention and they want to learn. A lot of these messages are sent to them day in and day out, and slowly, slowly, first they reject them, they dislike them, and they have, like, they have the right attitude towards them. But over time, this dissolves. And these ideas start sinking in and creating doubts in their minds. And they start creating questions. And some of these questions have a nagging nature. They keep coming back at them, requesting, because we need to make sense. This is how we humans are designed. We need to make sense of what's going on around us. So with a lot of these doubts and a lot of these questions, over time, they start having an impact on our children. And some of them start questioning their faith. Some of them end up actually leaving Islam. And my personal observation, and that's through you know, dealing with uh, this age group and a lot of the, you know, speaking with a lot of people who, a lot of like the brothers who go to universities, speaking about their colleagues, a lot of these guys, they secretly give up Islam. But for political reasons, and in order to survive with the family and not to have any conflicts, they decide to live the culture. So they will come to the masjid, 
They will pray, but they don't believe. For them, they don't believe even... Uh, they, they really doubt that Allah is there. They doubt that Islam is the truth. But they do this as a culture because they don't, have any, they, don't, they don't want to have any conflict with their families, with the community where they grew up in. But these people have a serious faith crisis. So <clears throat> if we don't prepare our kids to handle such challenges, then we might be failing them. And we might think that we're doing something good, okay, or we're doing enough, but a lot of the facts on the ground and in the field are actually showing that our children are going through a challenge that has been, that's unprecedented, and we need to develop new mechanisms, new strategies, and new tactics in order to handle these issues and protect our younger generation. Uh, <clears throat> and as I said, some of the things that I will be saying might be uncomfortable. As I said, give them the chance, give them a time until they settle and think about them over and over again. Discuss them with some, some other brothers. Discuss them with your wife or the wife with her husband and think about them. They might just open a new window of uh, you know, considering things or looking at things from a completely different angle. And sometimes this is what we actually need. <clears throat> I will be sharing some advice as to generally uh, how we should deal with our younger generation at a young age, how to set the grounds so that when they reach the, uh, that level when they make the transition to high school or to university, that they have enough emotional stability, enough uh, knowledge about Islam, a strong connection to the family, to the family, and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that these doubts that they are bombarded with and they face on a daily basis have the least impact on them. Have the least impact on them. I don't claim that what I'm going to share with you is uh, comprehensive. These are just thoughts. Uh, and as I said, one of my main points here is to instigate and spark a conversation. So the first step is that we start thinking about these things seriously. We take them seriously. And even if we don't see this happening to people who are all younger ones that are close to us, it's happening all over the Muslim community. And with, I mean, while ignoring it, putting our heads in the sand is not going to help us. It's not going to help us. We have to call a spade a spade. We have to look at the facts as facts. Sometimes we have to deal with the brutal facts in order for us to survive. Otherwise, we will be losing our younger generation uh, to an extent sometimes that might be irreversible. Uh, <clears throat> the first point that I, want to, uh, that I want to put forth is that a lot of our cultures have developed in the last few hundred years in Muslim countries where parenting is mainly associated with control. So the main paradigm in parenting has been control. Control. Because the parents have power. They are physically more powerful, mentally more powerful, emotionally more powerful, financially more powerful. They are the ones who provide for the kids. And they have the experience in life. They have the absolute power in the family. And this power is manifested in the form of orders, placing a system within the family that the kids are expected to follow completely, and sometimes the use of physical force. The use of physical force. So you will find a lot of tactics that are actually based on this. Based on, and it seems to have worked to a great extent because in the Muslim countries, on Muslim majority uh, countries, this culture seems to have worked. As the kids learn to respect their parents and be obedient to their parents, and the whole society is built on this. The whole society. So the kids don't have an exposure to anything else. Now when Muslims migrate to such countries, to Western countries, where there's a lot of freedom given to kids. And a lot of these principles like respect for parents and priority for the parents and the power of parents is actually challenged. And the kids are taught this in school, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, that you have rights. Sometimes the teachers speak directly to the kids and they tell them, do your parents beat you? Do they smack you? They force you and so on and so forth. So 
it seems, and I'm, 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 this conclusion, as I said, this is a personal conclusion, but I've seen it transpire in a lot of conversations. When the kid is usually uh, taught Islam by means of control, you have to pray. You have to pray. You have to fast. You have to dress up like that. You have to talk like this, and so on and so forth. In the early years, the kids still submit to that uh, power, I would say power imbalance, where the parents have control at a young age. But when the kid becomes a teenager and they are taught in school otherwise, and they see other kids show a lot of disrespect to the elderly and they get away with it, and sometimes they are rewarded for that, they start questioning this. And they start questioning that. What happens usually, and it's a dynamic process, the parents exert more control. Just the other day, I was speaking with one parent and he was complaining. And he said, you know, my kids have been raised in the masajid. He said, when my kids like, were born in the hospital, before taking, them to, before taking them home, each one of my kid was taken to the masjid. I would bring them to the masjid first. And he said, I raised my kids in the masjid. And now his kids are teenagers. And he says, if I don't tell them to pray, they don't pray. They don't pray. I have to be on top of them all the time to tell them to pray. I have to wake them up for fajr. And I, when they go into the washroom to get ready for salah, they take sometimes half an hour. They don't want to pray. So he says, unless I'm on top of them, unless the mother is chasing them, they don't pray. So what happened? What happened? Why is this the case? Why aren't the kids, you know, motivated from inside to pray themselves? Why? When they have grown up, and these kids have gone only to Muslim schools. They've never been to public schools. So, so they grew up in a Muslim environment. The house, mainly the parents are practicing. They spend a lot of time in the masjid. The other time they spend it in the school. It's an Islamic school. All what it a lot of what it teaches them is about Allah, about Islam, and about the prayer. So what's happening? That the, and this is, I'm not talking just about this brother. This is a, a recurrent theme. This is something that's very common. How many parents need to push their kids to pray? Sometimes they're, they're teenagers, and sometimes even they, like the kids who, who have reach, reached their 20s. They still have to remind them of each prayer. Have you prayed? They need to check on them all the time. So it seems when the kids see, when the kids have an escape somewhere else and they see a lot of freedom and they see people violating this kind of respect for the elderly and they get away with it and sometimes, as I said, they get rewarded. They start questioning whether this works or not. And this gives them a space for rebellion to be defiant to the parents. So. This kind of control, this kind of control doesn't seem to be working as it used to be. And there's something I need to draw your attention to. By the way, there is nothing here. It's not about black and white. You might pick some mistakes where some parents, you know, the kids were born in, in this country and they were raised in this country and based on this model of control, complete control, and the kids turned out to be perfect. It happens, you're gonna find these examples. But on the other side, you will find probably more numbers of such example actually failing. So we need to understand that this is not a black and white approach. It's a very dynamic approach. There are individual differences. There are individual differences. So we need to create, we need to find out a balance. We need to find out a balance of how much control we exert and how much space and freedom we give. And that's a very challenging thing to do. And this is why probably a lot of these suggestions and the propositions that you will see, uh, at least from my side, my, might raise more questions than they provide answers. And because this is such a challenging topic, it's a big topic, and it's not easy to just summarize it in uh, a lecture or to draw conclusions from personal experience, the experience of one or two people. This is something that we as a community have to engage in. We have to provide feedback. We have to create an awareness about it so that with this awareness, 
there will be a lot of people experimenting. There will be a lot of people who will share their examples, successful examples. Slowly, slowly, while creating this awareness, we will be better able to pinpoint what works and what doesn't work. What solves the problem and what exacerbates it. So, something I recommend is that we question the absolute use of power. And the power, in general terms, so it could, be, it could be physical, it could be emotional power, and the total control over the child. When the child sees, as a teenager, when they see other options, when they see other ways of life, they are going to question that and they will rebel, specifically that they are fed from a young age, that you have rights, no one can force anything on you, and so on and so forth. So what will happen? The kid will rebel. Not all the kids, as I said, there's no black and white here. You can't paint everyone with the same brush. People have individual differences. But we're talking about a considerable uh, portion within uh, our teenagers. So we need to pay attention to that. That's number one, which is the use of, <coughs> or the use of control. So I am proposing something or an alternative, and I believe it's better. And this alternative is actually not, is not a new thing, but it's taken from some examples from the early generations. And it makes so much sense. And it's been used by other communities. And that's basically to win your child over. Instead of using control, if you can befriend your children and win them over. Win them over in the sense that you become friends with them. That they trust you. That they look up to you that they are not frightened by you. So they don't have to pray because you are observing them. The other day I was, I heard something from some school children in some Muslim schools, not all of them. So it's, it's, it's unfair to generalize. But uh, these kids were saying that when the Salah, when Salat al-Dhuhr time comes, we are forced into the Salah. We have to pray, right? We're expected to pray. So everyone goes and make wudu, they have to make wudu. And the way it's been supervised is shows a lot of control. Listen, you guys, you have to go and make wudu now. Go and make wudu. There's a teacher observing them when they're making wudu. If anyone makes a mistake or tries to play around, they will be punished. Then they will be taken to the prayer hall or to the gym and they will pray. As they're praying, there are teachers policing them. There are teachers policing them. If anyone makes a mistake, they will either call out their name or they will walk to them like if they are not standing in the line, they will push them into the line. If they're making a mistake. For example, they're putting their hands wrongly. They will hold their hands and put them where they should be. So much control. So I asked some of these kids, do you pray at home? They said, no. So why do you pray in school? I'm, I'm scared because they will send me to the office. I'll be grounded. I'll be told off in front of everyone. So asking some of the kids, Show me how you make wudu. Sometimes, do you know what they do? They get some water, they just, they rub their hands and the face to show, to pretend that they made wudu. Why? Because they don't want to be caught. Parents also do the same. So, as I said, this might have worked in certain countries, certain cultures at certain times. But talking about our times, it still might work with some people, but it will definitely N not work with a, a big chunk of our teenagers. So the alternative, the better alternative, is actually to connect with your child at a deeper level. Connecting with your child at a deeper level means to win them over. You become friends with them. You let them trust you. Look at Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu, how he described the Prophet ﷺ. He said, as he describes the Prophet ﷺ, he says, ma la mas, ma la I have never touched a, a palm or a hand that is softer than the hand of the Prophet The Prophet never smacked a child or a servant or anyone. And he even And he never said for anything that I did, you shouldn't have done that. Or for something that I haven't done, you should have done that. That's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's, the, that's his approach. So there's lack of control. But lack of control 
is not actually leaving the children loose. Because when you leave the children loose, obviously they don't have guidance. But we're offering an alternative. Is that instead, and this is why I would like to put it in this way, instead of using hard power, use soft power. Use soft power. How do you use soft power? You win the trust of your child. And how do you win it? By becoming friends with them. You know when we lose our children, we lose them at a young age. And that's something about us. There's, <clears throat> this is a blindness in our perception. Humans don't see their mistakes. We don't see our mistakes. And we deliberately sometimes overlook our mistakes. So what happens? We live in denial of our mistakes. When a child needs to talk to the father, and the father has come back from work, he's tired, he needs some quiet time, the child feels the need, the emotional need to express their thoughts and speak their heart to their father. So the father says, leave me alone, I just need to take some rest. It's a very innocent act from the father. Very innocent act from the father. And I said, in other cultures it might work out. But here, we're, we're living in very difficult times, difficult conditions, there's a lot of challenges. And if you lose your child, there are other people who are vying and dying to win them over. And they have all the tools and the techniques. So, you might just say to your child, okay, just leave me alone, I need to take some time. Go to your mother. Or the mother might be busy, okay, leave me alone now. We think it's just a child, right? Two years old, three years old. What happens? This causes a scar in the child. They learn that they cannot, they cannot find uh, a listening ear when they need it from the parents. It's not going to happen from one time. It's not going to happen from two times, three times, ten times maybe. But when it happens over and over again, it creates a scar in the heart of the child. So they learn not to share or not to confide in to their parents. So what do they do? They start holding back and they start bottling up and they start venting outside the house with their friends, with their classmates. They start speaking. What does this do? From their classmates, they're going to hear similar stories. They will hear someone, their age, their experience, who will share the experience and validate their feelings and emotions. Slowly, slowly, they learn to trust ex people outside the house and not inside the house. And we are completely unaware of this because we think it's legitimate. I'm tired, I'm working like 10 hours every day. I'm working 8 hours every day. I've been stuck in the traffic for 2 hours and so on and so forth. I need some peace of mind, right? And rightly so. But you need to realize the kid needs to talk. And we oftentimes, we don't see our kids, and that's my, my next point. We don't see our kids as human beings. And there's something we have to be careful about. Your kids are not your property. Your kids are not your property. They're not like your car. They're not like your TV. They're not like a table. You don't possess them. They are a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't even own yourself. You don't even own yourself. We are supposed to say, Inna lillah, we belong to Allah. You don't even belong to yourself. So let alone your kids, that they belong to you. But we seem to be blinded to this. We think our, our kids are just like toys. We can do whatever we want. We can tell them off. We can tell them to stay silent. We can tell them to you know, do what we want them to do. We don't treat them as persons, as human beings who have feelings, who have intentions, who have desires, who have expectations, who have dignity and respect. Sometimes when a child, and oftentimes actually, when a child makes a mistake, we become judgmental. We tell them off. We punish them harshly. And sometimes the punishment is not to educate them. By the way, punishment as a principle, it does work. But when we punish our children, while we do this to avenge ourselves, to vent our anger, when it becomes personal, punishment backfires. Discipline backfires. The child feels that it's personal. But when you do this in a caring and loving fashion, discipline pays off. It pays off. So we need to remind ourselves and 
that this is a human being, this is a gift from Allah, a trust, that a precious trust from Allah that I am supposed to look after and deal with very carefully for the sake of Allah. So you deal with Allah through your child. And that's what Imam Al-Qayyim says. You're not just dealing with some, some property that you possess and own and you have full control over. This kind of attitude, unfortunately, obviously is very rampant and widespread in uh, other cultures. And mainly it's very common in Muslim countries. And like I said, it might work and it does work in those countries. But no longer, by the way, because the Western culture is taking over even Muslim countries. And we know this. So, uh, <clears throat> we need to change an attitude here. If you try to change a behavior without changing the attitude behind it, you're wasting your time. You need to see this child as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you are not entitled to do whatever you want, whatever you feel like in the moment, because that's your child. Your child doesn't mean your property. It means your child, that's your trust. You are supposed to help that child, get them ready to deal with life and to show them the way that leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's your job. So you have to take very careful care of the child. You cannot abuse that authority that Allah gave you. You cannot abuse it. And if you abuse it, you will be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, the same statement from Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu. The Prophet sallam was never like harsh with these kids would never tell them off, would never smack them. The Prophet ﷺ, how, he did, how did he deal with Al-Hasan al Hussein? The Prophet ﷺ, he himself sees one of the uh, children of his companions. He sees this child and he says, he knows that the child used to play with this little bird called an nughair small bird. The Prophet ﷺ looks at him and he plays with him and he says, Ya Aba Umayr ma fa'al an nughair That's the kunya, the nickname of this child, Aba Umayr. And it's rhyming. Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'al an nughair Oh Abu Umair, what did this little bird of yours do? Where did it go? What happened to it? So the Prophet Sallallahu who used to lead that nation, he would approach that child and he would speak, speak to him in that friendly manner. One of the younger companions, his name is Mahmoud radiyallahu anhu, he says, I remember when the Prophet Sallallahu came, when he was in Medina, first came to Medina, I remember him visiting us in our house, visiting my father. And I still remember when the Prophet ﷺ put some water in his mouth and he spat it in, and he splashed it and spat it on my face. He says, Lazilto Adkuru Majjatan Majjaha Rasulullah Sallallahu fi Wajhi wa ana ibn Khamsin when I was five years old. The Prophet ﷺ goes and visits his companion. The child comes around, the Prophet ﷺ has some water in his hand, he puts it in his mouth and he spits it in the face of that child as a friendly gesture. The Prophet ﷺ was giving the khutbah, the khutbah on Friday, where no one is supposed to talk, you're supposed to listen. It's a very formal setting. Al Hassan and Al Hussein walk into the masjid wearing new clothes, new thobes. So they were a little bit long, so they stumbled and they, they fell. The Prophet ﷺ left the member and he went to them, he carried them and brought them back with him on the member. Then he carried on his khutbah. Then he said, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةٌ And he says, الْمَالُ وَالْبَنُونَ زِينَةُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا He says, these children are like the beautification of this life. They are the adornment of this life. So he says, when I saw them, I could not, I, I could not even hold myself back. I, I sort of found myself, that's what the statement sort of translates, I found myself approaching them and carrying them. So these are a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are not supposed to see them as our property. When we see them as our property, we will abuse that. When we don't feel, when we feel drained, when we, our willpower has been exhausted by you know, work, by traffic, by certain people who don't treat you well here and there, basically you will abuse that authority. And we will pay a very hefty price for that. So we need to see them as trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will help us uh, give them genuine respect. Genuine respect. Something that helps with this is to see your child in your mind's eye 20 years later. 
20 years later. He's five years old or she's five years old. Deal with them while you have in mind that 20 years from now they will be a complete adult. This will stop you, hold you back from using force, by the way. Because yes, they are now helpless. I have the power. But what about 20 years from now? Will I still use the power or the force? And a lot of people have used force with their kids. Now when their kids reach a defiant age, sometimes it's as early as 13, sometimes earlier, or 15, or 18, or 20, the child starts speaking back. So what worked for you in the first 10 years of their life, and you were feeling safe, you had control, that's not going to last. And now they have developed so much pain, emotional pain from that, they're going to take it back on you. And now they have all the support from external sources, all the brainwashing, and they also, they're gonna, they have the power, personal power. So they will be defiant to you, they won't respond to you. So better options would be to actually win them over. Win them over. So from a young age, from a young age, we need to look at our mistakes. Small things that happen, as I said, a child wants to talk to you and you don't have the time for that. Or a child says something and it sounds ridiculous for you because you, you know this since you were a kid. But for the child, it's a revelation. It's, it's, a, it's a learning experience, it's something new. Something that makes them feel proud about themselves. And for you, oh, that's normal, what are you talk about this? Obviously for you, I mean, you're an adult, but for the child, it means the world for them. If you recognize their innocence and their immaturity, and you actually respect that, and you grow with them. And this is why Umar ibn Khattab himself, radiallahu anhu, he said, ينبغي للرجل أن يكون في أهله كالطفل الصغير. He says a man, when he goes back home, he's supposed to be a child. You're supposed to behave like a child. Stop using your brain, that's right, that's wrong. That works, that doesn't work. Forget about your professionalism, become an innocent child. Play with the kids, win them over. It seems to be a very co common notion that it's normal, that's the default situation where kids are going to confide in their friends. They, they're going to trust external sources or external individuals outside the family, not the parents. They don't trust the parents. It seems like the default, no. This only happens if there's a mistake in the relationship. I'm telling you, it only happens. The child by nature, they are designed to look up to their parents. They crave the love of their parents. They want the friendship of their parents. If you offer genuine, genuine, I'm not saying fake it. If you fake it, it doesn't work. They'll see through it. They'll see it as manipulation and they will see it as control, as passive control. And they would actually rebel against it. Give them genuine love, genuine concern, open up to them and engage with them at the level of their innocence and the level of their mind. Become a novice again, become a child again with them. Share their beautiful moments and experiences and we'll talk something in, in a bit more depth about this when we talk about how to create a, a family culture that is conducive for preparing our children for what's going to happen or for the challenging they will face. So when you become a child with them and you open up to them, whenever they want to speak, they'll find you there. Whenever they need help, they'll find you there for them. Whenever they need your attention, they will, you will be all ears for them. You will notice that they will come to you because you are the most trustworthy source in their life. They will tell you about their friends and they will tell you about their own mistakes because they will feel safe. And this kind of myth will be completely debunked. That kids trust their teachers or they trust their friends, they trust people their age, they don't trust their parents. No, because you have pushed them away for so long, you have judged them for so long that they have learned not to trust you. And that's why they search for trust and for love outside the house. That's not a joke. And if this kind of trust is broken between the parents and the child, when the child goes to university and they hear bombardment and they hear challenging of the faith of their parents, specifically if they have scars, emotional scars, but you have to pray, you haven't prayed, you smack them, you beat them up, you tell them off, you cut them off for a couple of days, you don't even talk to them. And that's hard for the child, by the way. They might show resilience, they might show defiance, 
but the kids will wear a mask in that sense. Kids are very vulnerable, but they will seem defiant. But deep inside, they're, trim they're trembling with fear. They're very vulnerable. But because when you challenge their dignity, they will put on a mask. They will pretend that they, they're, they're indifferent, they don't care. But they're crying inside. But when you challenge their dignity, that's what they have to do. They have to wear a mask. So when, you, when that trust is broken, and there's a lot of trauma about salah, you know, you have to pray, and you beat them up when they don't pray. And you have to do this, you have to go to the masjid. I don't feel like going to the masjid. You beat them up, or you tell them off, or you disrespect them, and so on and so on. So much trauma. When they go to university, and it tells them these religi religions are, are a myth, they were created by these homo sapiens, or these early human beings, in order to make sense of the world. They, they wanted something to respect, something to, they created some all these funny stories about where life, how life started, where life came from, and so on and so forth. And, you know, there's no hellfire, there's no paradise, there's no last day, there's only life, we are just random chance that we came about into this existence, there's only the universe, why waste your life? Everyone is enjoying, they look at their friends, their colleagues, they're all enjoying their life, they're drinking, they're smoking weed, they're going out with girls, and even our narrative and this is something we'll talk about, our narrative that we told them, if you disobey Allah, Allah will destroy your life. They look around, they see evidence to the contrary. Like these people do everything that's haram, they seem to be enjoying their life. They're getting very good grades, and they're graduating, they're getting job opportunities, and they seem to be happy. But I'm miserable. Put all of this together in one context, what's going to happen? That's so overwhelming. That's so overwhelming. So this is why we need to win over our kids. We cannot afford to create this disconnect with them. No way. No way. And if it worked in certain societies, in certain environments, at certain times, maybe it worked. But it seems the signs today that this thing is not working anymore. This control, it might work out with some individuals, as I said. But for the majority of the kids, it will actually distance them from the parents. Later on, with more doubts being the, that they are bombarded with in university and high school, they will start questioning their faith. So how to prepare our kids for the future? There's a lot of things we can do, teach them, and obviously uh, teach them Islam and educate them and all that stuff. But if we do not build all of this on things similar to what I described, and as I said, these are early attempts to address the issue. If we do not really address these issues and build that foundation, so when we teach them Quran and teach them Islam, it's based on this environment of love and trust and care and attention and this strong connection between parent and child, there will be a lot of cases where our education will go down the drain and it will not help our younger generation. And they might succumb to the calls of the people try to push them away from their faith and push them into atheism or agnosticism or cause them into sometimes even uh, some different sexual orientation. So we need to create that emotional, safe emotional, personal uh, family environment for our children. And by doing that, we give them a very powerful foundation and standing to face the challenges that need a lot afterwards as well in terms of education and in terms of learning. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. Uh, develop our kids and help them or equip them to face whatever challenges they will be facing in their times and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the younger generation of the Muslims. Barakallah feekum for your attention and for listening and for your attendance in the first place. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. There will be by the way uh, Q&A sessions during, inshallah during the conference so if you have a question preferably write it down or keep an, take a note so inshallah you get to uh, ask your question, hopefully it will be answered. Barakallah feekum. If you have time, absolutely yes. Yeah. If you have uh, five minutes for, for one question or two questions, anybody in this topic though first? Yes. There's a brother here, yeah. In the front. Yeah. So with some people might listen to this, they might already have relationships with their parents who said that. So what is the first step to repairing that? Or moving towards bridging that gap? That's a very good question. Some families are already based on what we described as more excessive control and lack of love and so on and so forth. And uh, how can we change this? 
you don't have, and this is one of, actually an aspect of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes you don't need to fix your mistakes. What you need to do is undo them. And you undo them, and that's a secret thing about humans. You know, children, the number one thing that children crave is love, unconditional love. Unconditional love. If you offer someone genuine love and care, you transform them completely. And that's in the Quran. Not with your kids. Allah is talking about enemies. Someone treats you bad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, respond with goodness. Respond with goodness is not your fake goodness, it's genuine goodness. Genuine, and that's how the Prophet ﷺ was. People would persecute him, would physically attack him, would speak bad about him. Yet the Prophet ﷺ would be genuine. He was really concerned for their guidance. What happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the hearts of a lot of them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنُ السَّيِّئَةِ Respond to evil with goodness, genuine goodness. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Lo and behold, the person with whom or who has enmity towards you, they would turn into a very close and intimate friend. وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٌ So it requires a lot of patience, and requires a lot of tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how to reverse the process is to change the attitude. You don't control that child. You don't own them. This is a gift from Allah. It's a miracle from Allah that has given it to me um, and, and I'm gonna love this gift from Allah. Just love that person. He's my blood and my flesh. She's connected to my soul. She's connected to my soul. Love them from that. You don't have, you, as a parent, it's your fitrah to love your kids. But all you need to do is pay attention, more attention to that and awaken it. And if you give the child genuine love, genuine love, that will, that will actually suffice you and that will be more than, more than enough. Then, and better alternative than learning techniques. A lot of parenting techniques don't work without the real genuine love, by the way. If you use them, they will be seen, they will be deemed by the child as cheap attempts for control and manipulation. The real secret about parenting, the real secret is unconditional love. Even when you discipline them, even if you're pointing their mistakes, do that with love and it will be like a miracle.